allow McCoy. I will allow. I will allow yeah. Coach Tyrell to coach special teams, but I will have my eye on him. Um, I don't know what that means. <laughs> that's a remember the Titans reference. Yeah, I don't really like soccer movies. But. It's, it's a football movie. Uh, what do we got? I got to go to Bro Research Radio, Stitcher. What is this, episode 19? Episode 19? Yeah, yeah, right on track. Six months later. Season two. Season two. <laughs> yeah, season two. That's what I was. Yeah. Season two. I don't know We're why. We're always at eight, 18, 18 episodes in a season. That's how it always Yeah, goes. well, we had nine, and then we just immediately went into season two. So this is actually season it's three. Great. Um, back. There'll, there'll be nine episodes. This first one, this, <laughs> this I don't know when they're gonna come out. Maybe, maybe June will be episode two. Yeah, uh, yeah. episode two of season three, which will be episode twenty. Uh, <laughs> so Brian and I've been jamming back and forth uh, for the last couple of weeks about this idea of decreased work output on subsequent sets. Um, and you, you sent me a really, really nice video that you might share with the general public. Um, the, the graph, the graph was impeccable. <laughs> <laughs> I have since updated the graph. It still doesn't line up. Uh, but it, I, I still feel, I'll still stand by this. It's my best work to date. Yeah, you had, you had, it's funny, like you had a, you had a two dimensional graph, but you had four axes on there. And so you had like a X, a Y, a Z, and then yeah, so like different axes that had all different meanings. Yeah, yeah. And that's why it takes eight and a half minutes to explain the graph. So it's not <laughs> something you actually never get to the point either. It's just mostly, mostly explaining the graph, explaining, yeah, yeah, explaining yeah. the visual. Yeah. 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 Here, here are the, this is the first X axis and then the second X axis. And then, yeah, yeah. It, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it does. Well, Watch the video mm -hmm. when it comes out sometime around episode 20 of Bro Research Radio. Which mm -hmm, was season, around. season three, episode two. Uh, yeah. So the, the big thing that, and I've been having this discussion, um, ironically, with, with a couple other people via email and, and messaging. And this idea that rep drop-offs. So, and there's a lot of different, we were trying to compile all the research for this, this talk. And there's a, there's a lot of different things that we necessarily have to talk about. We don't have a lot of direct research on this individual question. So is doing four sets of eight or whatever, eight, seven, seven, seven probably would be more real life at a two IRR versus 10, five, 10, six, five, five. Is there gonna be a quantifiable difference if we're talking about straight sets? Is there gonna, do those, do those count equally? And I think this comes back to the question of how the hell do we count volume? Um, and you've been, you've been digging into this. So where you, where's your head at? Yeah. So I think a lot of this discussion for me kind of starts with that 2012 paper from Stu Phillips lab, I believe that kind of stated that, that the load on the bar probably doesn't really matter that much in terms of the actual multi mu uh, muscle protein synthesis response, if we're going to volitional failure. So I think they found as low as 30% loads kind of elicited the same response as your traditional weight training would. So when people saw that, they're like, hell yeah, man, like I don't need to put a lot of weight on the bar. It's still going to suck. I still got to train really hard. But, you know, if I'm losing my work output throughout the workout, it probably doesn't matter. And I'm not sure that that's what it was intended to say in the beginning. I think if we're talking about one set versus one set. I'm fresh on both of those sets. I take an eight RM to eight reps, 10 RPE. Or if I take a 30 RM to 30 reps, 10 RPE, those two things are equal. But I think with that, I think it's carried over, kind of stemmed over into this idea that if we, as long as we're doing a 10 RP or an 8 RP or, or whatever proximity to failure, the weight on the bar doesn't actually matter. And I'm not sure that we can say that. So that's kind of where my head's at with, with that. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah. I guess that. The, there's a lot of practical issues and a lot of research issues I see with extrapolating that out to trained individuals. And so this is one of, this is one of my big things is take your 30 rep max and then try to do it. That shit again. Like, just go, go try to just try to do this. Like you're not going to be strength training. You're going to be doing cardio. Yeah. absolutely. And, and so I think when we want the limiter and this kind of gets into the talks of like, what are you actually training for right now? 
Um, if you're training for an increase in muscular tension via progressive overload, via probably more like Ronnie Coleman, more weight for more reps. If you're training in that way, then I think you want to limit the amount of fatigue on the system. Now, if you're training for a different thing, if you're training for capillarization, if you're training for metabolic stress, if you're training to increase your work output, that's a different thing. And I think a lot of people in our current situation in the world, I think they're training in, a, I think they should, you can put on muscle. I, it, it's entirely possible. Now, if you're highly trained, are you going to probably put on muscle doing that? Maybe you, you could get a massive pump um, if you've never done that type of training before. But the thing that we've talked about is if your limiter is something else. So if your limiter is just your, your ability to deal with that amount, because a 30 rep back squat, you're going to be at you know, 90 seconds, two minutes. If you're going fast, like if you're going pretty fast, like a 10 rep max is generally going to be around 45 seconds if you're taking a breath in between. So you're running a, a 400 Long meter set. I mean, you're running, you're running a 400 meter sprint, like mm -hmm. a legit, like, yeah, you're not under constant tension, but it's going to be pretty tough. And so you, you're not, now you're not just stressing that one system. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. and then on top of that, and untrained, this is, this is my biggest beef with this entire literature is the analogy that we were talking about is, is, is essentially baking. And so if you want to get to a critical temp, right? And so untrained people, like you, it's real easy to get to that critical temperature and then you're just burning them, right? Whereas if you're a trained person, if you're a trained athlete and you know, you're squatting double body weight, you're, you're bench pressing, you know, 1.5 body weight, maybe even for reps, that you got to do a lot more to get to that critical temperature. Um, and, and so when you're looking at these untrained populations, like, yeah, you wouldn't necessarily expect like pre-exhaust or these rest pause sets or any of these drop sets, you wouldn't expect it to really be any different because they don't need that much to maximize the stimulus anyways. Mm -hmm. uh, so in my mind, in my mind, it's just kind of a faulty, re I understand like we, yes, maybe you can take some stuff away from that, but the population just doesn't need that much mechanical stress to get the stimulus anyways. And so are we really, really, are we comparing, are we looking at what we really want to look at in the, inside of those questions in that population? Yeah. 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 And I think that that's like the first thing that you always have to look, I, I'm at the point now when I, when I look at research, it's like, I'm looking at the subjects first and like, okay, I, not that I'm going to throw it away just because it's untrained subjects, but I want to see who are these people. <laughs> that's incredibly important. And even if it says, says trained subjects, like there's usually some kind of measure that they're using to determine whether or not they're trained. I think it's really important to figure out what that is because that sometimes just means more than six months of resistance training. I, I don't think that necessarily makes someone well-trained. So it's really important to, to look at that right, right off the bat. Then I think with this question, I think a lot of people that are a little more astute would, would totally agree with, with everything that you just said right there. Hey, if I take a 30 rep back squat to failure, of course, I'm going to be completely gassed by the time I do a second set. I won't be able to get to 30 reps again because everything in my entire world has just fallen apart. So now the more interesting question to me, and this I think is what we're going to get more into, is the counter argument to, to this is, hey, well, it doesn't really matter if you get to 30 reps because you're still training really hard. You're still going after. So even if you get you're talking about reps, set two, you're talking about set two. I'm talking about set two. Set one, I don't really care that much about set one. We're all going to do at least one set, right? So that's not really a very interesting question. The the interesting question is what's that? Ooh, I got a counter to that. I got a counter to that. You're going to do no sets? No. So <laughs> this is this is one of my favorite studies. This is the bench press study from 2017 in Brazil where yeah. they. They just basically asked 160 dudes what their 10 rep max was. So I'm not convinced that the majority of people are even doing one set. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not convinced. Like, That's fair. Yeah. And, and I'm not convinced totally that they're doing one set when you got to do a 30 RM because that Hell no. shit sucks. Hell no. Yeah. Hell no. Look, so look at these dudes. Like 160 recreationally trained men. They asked them to estimate their 10 rep max. Seven of them completed 10 reps. Completed. 10 reps and no more. Uh, they, they, no, they said, Hey, this is my 10 rep max. I'm gonna go do my 10 rep max. And they, yeah. that's the seven of a percent. Seven, they got it right. seven, seven of 160 <laughs> got it right. Yeah. yeah. But, like you guys can see right here, like 26% of them were a quarter of them were getting more than 20 reps, like more than 19 reps with their, with their 10 rep max. 
And we saw this in the jungle. Like, totally. mm-hmm. I think you, me, and John, because we've been training our asses off. John and I have been training with VBT for like six months before this. So like we knew where the hell we were. And we hit 10 reps on our first set on day one. And then we never hit 10 reps again. Whereas a lot of other people were like 17. Like, and so I think that, <laughs> so when we see in the research, when you see the train to failure, I, I'm not convinced that they're actually training to failure. I don't think that they are. And then you combine that with rest pause sets, maybe on that third rest pause set, they actually hit failure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and maybe that's what they, they actually needed. It, it's it, Yeah, that's a, I'm really glad. I know we're going to talk about that at some point. So, and I know you're like super excited to talk about that because I, I love that. Because so, you, you love that shit. You love calling people out. You say, hey, <laughs> you think you're training hard. <laughs> cool, that's cute. I like that. That's really sweet. Uh, no, nah, yeah, like, and I, I totally agree. Like, and so, so again, like I, even, even if you throw that out, uh, mm-hmm. I still think that that second set is really where the conversation is. The third set, fourth set, because I still think that those people are, well, you know what? I do go to failure mm-hmm. and I go to failure again and I go to failure again. And I can show you that the, the drop, I can show you that I'm training hard because I did 10 reps, then I did seven reps and then I did four reps and that people will extrapolate those studies out saying, Hey, doesn't the load on the bar doesn't matter because I'm still putting in a 10 out of 10 effort. And I'm assuming that if this person is saying that, that they actually are. And, and we've done this. You like, we, mm-hmm. we, I think when you and I do this, we're actually doing it. If we're seeing that kind of drop off, it's not because we just decided we didn't want to push the weight anymore. We just decided that we would rather not shit our pants on a leg press or just like completely get your collapse under the weight, whatever it is. Like we're actually going to a 10 RP. So that that is where the 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 conversation kind of kicks off and where it gets interesting to me is is like the question is is effort really the proxy for stimulus and what's happening as we get fatigued and can we actually use that as a measure for hard sets at some point just because the sets are hard are they actually effective yeah and, and this is we have to acknowledge that this is an extremely tumultuous field of research and and you and i are on one side of the fence but the side of the fence that we're on is not like cut and dry it's not like oh these guys are clearly like so and and the research you you can pull from you can pull from the train to failure train not to failure you can pull from myo reps pre-exhaust whatever whatever area you want to pull from you can pull from all of those and and kind of make a case for yourself um and you can make a case for the null finding a lot easier than you can make a case for this actually mattering. Mm-hmm. Totally. Uh, and I think where we can, if we're going to make the case that you, sh- you should train one to two reps. So, so this is kind of our ideal world if we're training to maximize muscular tension. Um, it, using compound lifts, I think that's, a, that's also a big asterisk there. Like, so let's just keep it contextual in that this person can train to failure. They have built that ability in their life. Um, and they, they've, should they take set one? Should they take that to a one or two? Or sh- should they take that to a two reps in reserve? So we're really arguing about minutia here. So if they, if they took their 10 rep max to an eight, if they could just hit eight across four sets, they're at 32 reps. Whereas if they, they took it to an actual 10 rep max, you know, where your fucking eyes blow out of your face. And, and now their second set, if you do that, your second set is going to like, so today, I, just, to, just to kind of preface this talk, I took a back squat to, a, uh, I, I could have got one more. So it was, it was a one IRR. Um, mm-hmm. And I, it was at 0.23 meters per second. Uh, people cringe watching it because it's fucking slow totally, slow yeah. mm-hmm. and then on the second set just to prove a point i hit 0.25 and then i hit fucking 0.21 and it was even nastier um and so so i think you stay away from those reps because those reps cost you a lot of reps in the back end of that week yeah. um and so that's our argument is is if you get 32 reps across the four sets now say you go train to failure and you only get 26 or 24 reps you're you and I would make these that those are less good. Yeah, I, I would I would think so. 
And I, I think uh, like most people just throw this out there, like the volume thing being the best thing for hypertrophy. And I don't think that that argument in itself without caveats is, is really that good. But hey, if you want to use that argument, look at the fucking numbers, man. Like <laughs> you're doing more work. And like, I think most people agreed at that point that it's probably better, but I think there's a very specific reason why that more work is actually better. If we were, we're going to run into trouble, like it's, we're going to run into trouble with our argument because if you look at, doing multi-joint versus single joint exercises first. So if you do single joint exercises first, your total workload for the, if, in the research, your total workload is generally 50% less. Um, so if you did tricep extensions before you did bench press, you're not going to get as many benches. Uh, if you, if you did leg extensions before you do squats, you're not going to get as much, you're not going to get as many reps as squat and your total work volume is going to go down. But that, those studies aren't far and away wins for the multi-joint first. They're not. Um, and so we have, we have to acknowledge that fact. But I still think that if we're, if we're talking about quality of work, because so that's kind of, if you're after this muscular tension, if you're training muscular tension, you are after quality of work. You're just after accumulating yeah. a ton of quality work. Yeah, we're not talking about like metabolite production. We're not, we're not talking about just increasing strength or something. Like we're talking about very specifically fiber tension. And I think the strength, ironically, I think the strength research is where we can pull a lot from this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Be yeah. Because exercise order matters for strength. Mm -hmm. Doesn't necessarily in the meta analysis from 2020 by Nunez. So exercise order, the, if you want to get good at something, you do it first because mm -hmm. um, you're going to get more reps at it. And they made the they made the assumption that well in their analysis it didn't matter for hypertrophy, but these are not very long studies and their trained subjects are probably not that trained. So if you're getting an increase in strength in those first exercises, but you're not necessarily getting an increase in strength in those later exercises in your workout, I would make the I would actually make the case that over time, if you're if you're after muscular tension, that matters. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big thing too, is like this stuff, it takes a long time to actually pick up any kind of result in terms of hypertrophy. So it, it could also get, and I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not picking apart the studies to try to drive my argument. It's just like something we, we actually really need to consider is that it, it takes a long time to even pick up changes in hypertrophy, whereas strength it happens right away. You can pick it up in that day. <laughs> like you just flip the order and see that you did less weight. Oh shit. Like it, it has an effect. So yeah, it's it just, maybe it's just a case of not enough time or statistical power to, to be able to show any kind of difference there. I, I would agree. And, I, I mean, and it would make sense. Uh, and I think that we see that a lot uh, practically. It just, it seems that like, as you, you're going to have that period of time where you just get stronger. And then if you continue to, to chip away at that, that particular exercise, and that seems to be when things actually take place in terms of hypertrophy. But very difficult to measure again. <laughs> like that's just not something that's that cut and dry. And this is my, this is my big thing. It's hard to measure hypertrophy. We have ultrasound units. We've gotten, I've been dexed every body comp under the sun. I've been MRI like in a cross section and looking at my leg. Like I've had every body comp done and they're all like, it's real hard to measure. Uh, and so in all these measuring, they all have error rates. We talked about this previously. And, and so the best measurement for hypertrophy might be like volume across sets when you're keeping tempo and rest the same on a stupid movement. I'm not talking about like a, a high scale movement, like, like back squatting or front squatting or bench, even bench pressing, like compound lift, like preacher curl, uh, leg extension, like stupid things that don't take a lot of coordination and that you can just get dumb. Uh, and also you have, I think you have to control for momentum. Because there's a lot of ways to cheat in those exercises. If you're throwing a leg extension out of the bottom, like, are, yeah, you're going to get a lot more reps, but you're not really do you're not really training the quads. Then you're just like catching weight at the top. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's got to if, if you're doing this, you got to be honest with yourself. Um, and it could you might not get stronger on that first set, but I think if you can keep the rest intervals the same and your your three set or four set preacher curl numbers go up, that to me is probably our best metric. If you if that goes up, I think you're probably getting bigger. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I agree with that. But if you want to look bigger, you want to be curls every time before you leave the house. Which is that's what I do. 
yeah. it's pretty obvious. Pretty obviously in March. Uh, like I'm a grower, so yeah. Obviously, hit the cable cable machine every time before I left the house. Yeah, uh, no coincidence that the, the cable machine is upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is a big deal. So there are other things to train for outside of doing more weight for more reps. There are other things that you can build into your training protocol. And I think it's good to have those blocks in your training protocol, but we're going to make the argument that the majority of your time probably should be spent. If you're after hypertrophy, probably should be spent on these muscular tension blocks because that looks to be the main driver of hypertrophy so far. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to approach this from that perspective is that like, we're going to appreciate that the things we're going to talk about may be good for other things that may or may not result in hypertrophy, but we're coming at it from the angle of, we're trying to elicit the most mechanical tension on the fiber itself. That's probably going to be the best proxy for, for hypertrophy. And that's kind of where we're going to, we're going to go with this. So do you want to start with, um, kind of, should we start with what, what happens when we actually train to failure, when we take something, a set really hard, like what's, wh how, what's happening, uh, from like a neurological perspective and, and from the peripheral response that's actually reducing the amount of work that we're doing because we know that if initially when we train really hard we're going to get the most motor unit recruitment we can possibly get again on that one set basis right we go closer to failure we're going to get more motor unit recruitment we're gonna get more stimulus uh, as we can assume because of that maybe not max tension though you're gonna get ma i think you're gonna get max motor recruitment but there's there's an argument for if you actually get max tension on those th high threshold motor units because your tension on the system is actually going down like your force output is actually going down as you um, get more fatigued yeah so yeah, like yeah. like how you but then you get in the argument which which greg knuckles does very well and is effective like the argument against effective reps is like you don't see you don't see max isometrics being that in, like no one that those haven't like rose to the top of the bodybuilding world of like 60 mm -hmm. seconds max East ISOs. Um, so we wouldn't expect that to be a huge thing. Yeah. And that's, and that's really important too. Cause it's like, cause when I say we need to train hard, it doesn't necessarily mean we need to train to failure, especially if we're talking about motor unit recruitment, if we're, if we're talking about that, that that's not the be all end all. Mm -hmm. Um, especially when we consider that you're probably going to get max recruitment, a few reps shy of failure anyway. And that seems like at some point, yeah, force production actually starts to drop off. And that would be evidenced by the fact that you can't do the weight anymore. <laughs> at some point, like you're, you're no longer recruiting something or you run out of substrate or you run out of neural drive or what, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. At some point, there needs to be an initial amount of effort that needs to be pretty hard. And then it's, at some point, it's kind of like diminishing returns or, or potentially even worse. Yeah. Yeah. And, and from a, this probably applies more in the single joint world than because you're getting, you're getting a stretch when you do like a multi, like when you do a compound movement, like when you squat, like, cause it's not just all about muscle, like it's collagen yeah. pulling on muscles. Yeah, like, so you are, you are like, if you do a hard, so the, the EMG data and the muscle activation data is like you probably if you're if you're training hard like if you're if you're jumping out the when you if you're screaming at yourself jump out of the bottom of the squat you're probably getting a good amount of motor recruitment even doing one rep at like a 50 percent of your one rm so less so in single joint metrics where there's you know there's not a huge stretch component um and like a bicep curl where you're the hardest part of the lift is at the top um, now you, now you can mess with that and you can make the hardest part at the bottom and then maybe you get that stretch. But the, if we're talking about like why people fatigue, the, we have the central and the peripheral factors, right? And, and that's what I think like what we're trying to get at. And, and so there, I remember like, man, it might've been like five or six years ago, like everybody was just like yelling about central fatigue. Yeah. yeah. And like, like if you do my CMS, I like I can't tell you like how my CNS is cooked, dude. My CNS yeah, can't do it today. Can't deal with can't deal with more than once a week. CNS is cooked, dude. Yeah. CNS, and it just turned into this. I was like, really? Like, is this is this really a thing? Um, and it's not a thing. It's definitely not a thing. <laughs> it lasts like seconds. Um, like yeah, yeah. Can we, can we talk about that a little bit? Where's that? Where's it going? I mean, we're gonna end up linking all the, the articles that we're referring to here, but 
but that that one in particular is something that I wanted to talk about. So this is you're talking uh, the the four four sets of five back spot. Oh yeah, the one where they so had the one where they had the elite people. Like these dudes are shoot. Like we're talking yeah, about badass. Yeah, bad. Like it's way faster than me. Way stronger than me. Yeah, yeah. Way way faster than I'll ever be. Maybe yeah, not. Yeah. Like, and so, like push pressing, split squats, and back squats. Um, they did four by five of heavy. And like we, this is a workout where we think people would be, you know, they if they're just gonna drive some central fatigue, this would be it. Mm -hmm. uh, and people, people are like, how are long? people capable of going there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like we're not talking about untrained people lifting one thirty five. On not to say that that's bad, uh, but it's bad. Um, and so, <laughs> but we're talking about people, people like legit people that and, matter in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not that we're I took not that we're far. not not like we're excluding everyone. Um, and no, but like legit athletes, I'm not that because we're not legit athletes, so we might as well just talk about them. And and, and so they and people are like, how long does central fatigue last? And they're like, uh, there wasn't any. They did they didn't have any central fatigue. Uh, yeah. So so how do they how do they measure that? Like just for people that that don't know. Uh, there's a gap, so they shock you. Um, they see how much you can voluntarily contract and then they basically e-stim you and then they see yeah, how and then they do contract. more when they get e-stimmed right so it's like mm -hmm. oh okay so it's not just this central fatigue that's happening like there when we when we elicit that response uh involuntarily then all of a sudden they can push more weight so what does that tell us it's probably peripheral factors it is peripheral factors that are uh make you do less yeah it's it's muscle damage like the the as you get more muscle damage, you your contractile proteins they just there's a lowering force output like that's and there's also like your metabolite production um, that'll do the same thing like we're not robots yeah. we're not like thing is we're like at all, like you're this is something you have to train to be able to go there repeatedly is something that you have to train because you're like fatigue is task specific and and so this is my this is one of my big things is 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 having clients test it so like test test your leg extension first see how many reps you get and then my guess is if you did a bunch of iso movements you could you wouldn't cuz cuz fatigue is you're not going to have a ton of systemic fatigue if you had rest right if you did if you did a chest fly, then you did a bicep, like probably not. If you did a chest fly, then you did a leg extension, then you did tricep extension, then you did a hamstring curl. Should be fine. Yeah. My guess is you're not. There no those aren't going to affect each other. You can do them whatever order you want because. Yep. But when you start throwing these multi joint compound lifts, where you, if you take them to fatigue, like you your blood pressure is going to rise. Like should it's just like if you've done those type of reps, you know. Like I don't have to explain to you those reps cost something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, and we're making the argument that that cost is not worth it chronically don't want to go to that well i think that you need to go to that well for testing though yes yeah yeah i think that that like again we have to speak about just where you're starting at as a in your training career like if you're just beginning then this this conversation is not really for you this is assuming that you actually can go to that place and not just think you can go to that place. Like, because a lot of people, when they first, cause I've worked with plenty of people that like when they first start out, they actually legitimately are working really, really hard, but they're just so nervous, like so inefficient that it, it doesn't really matter how hard they really try to work. Like everything is not on board yet. So it really, this, this really is a conversation for people that are, that are well-trained and that have, can go to that place and willingly probably like to go to that place. Uh, or else it's just not really relevant. Yeah, because you probably if you're if you're untrained and you're and you're listening and that's not a, we're not saying that 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 is a bad thing, but there's no reason for you really to go over sixty percent of your one rep max because you don't have a one rep max yet, anyways. And yeah. so you just got to accumulate some time, some effort over time. Yep. Uh, and for and and you really can probably train twice a week and get really really good results with straight sets and linear progression. Like that's how you, how it, as long as you don't get bored. Uh, and, and that's what, like, you got to keep people on the ship if you're a trainer. And so that's why I think you use these other blocks to keep people excited because as we've talked about, like training for hypertrophy is pretty boring. Like mm. it's, and, and so you need to, you need to break up the monotony, um, training for some of these other qualities. And if someone doesn't is, is relatively untrained and they, you know, they're a blank slate, 
you can you can rise a lot of things up at once. Now, if you're an advanced trainee, you probably want to accumulate quality volume as often as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's where going to fatigue probably chronically, especially on multi-joint lifts, is the cost benefit ratio is not in your favor uh -huh. because you're not you might actually get you might actually get less muscle activation in those less in those last reps and we've actually found that even in trained people if those their speeds can go up yeah because they change how they're moving like especially on a on a on a squat, even on a bench, like you can you can rotate out and push it to bounce the end. it more or whatever yeah you find a way yeah. Mm -hmm. And so just being honest with yourself and being consistent, like, and, and our goal is like to get 3D cameras too and to see like, all right, like, are you, yes, so you went from 0.4 meters per second to 0.3 meters per second, and then you went back up to 0.34 meters per second. How the hell did that happen? Well, you, you just changed your angles. Like you just used a little bit different, you used more erectors probably. Um, mm -hmm. and a squat to get that done. And so from a hypertrophy standpoint, you've already cooked the goose. Get out. Yeah, yeah, rack, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, what are we doing with the rest of those 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 reps? It's like you're, they're probably just recruiting different tissues, probably not the tissues that you want. And even if, you, even if you're still staying in it, do we really need that? Did we already get what we needed? And now are we just, are we just cutting into our recovery time because I think at some point, I mean, we definitely see that the time course for, for MPS is declines with, with training age too, right? So, mm -hmm. so I think at some point, it's like you're going you're gonna to get as much stimulus as you're going to get. And then the most important thing for you is to get into it again as quickly as possible mm -hmm. and just, just keep hitting that hammer. So I, I think at some point, it just it doesn't seem to work. And, and I think that we see, is that the, uh, the Barbalho studies where they did, what, what is like the German volume training? Who, who did that study? Because that's- uh, It starts with an A, where, yeah, five sets. I know sets. we have it in here somewhere, but it, it so it's- Five sets, like this, five sets up yeah. from 10. And, and everyone will be like, oh, well, it's because they did it all in one session. Like, well, that's exactly the point. Mm -hmm. No, you wouldn't do, well, we wouldn't do 20 sets in a session, but a lot of people actually do. That, that's old school bodybuilding stuff, man. And people, and it's not even old school. Like, that's still what's going on for the most part. And, and one side of, of the bodybuilding sphere is like, that's basically how a lot of them are still training. A lot of drop sets, uh, you know, whatever they like, just accumulating a ton of work for one muscle group in a session or maybe two, and then resting the rest of the week. That but feels it, good. It feels amazing. Like, come on, dude. Like, I mean, a lot of times it's like, so I was thinking about this day. I was like, man, like, why the fuck did I take the blue pill? The red pill was so much better. You know, like before I was like completely ignorant. I mean, and that's not true. Like, I love, I love training. Like, I still enjoy it more than ever. But, uh, you know, sometimes it was just fun. We didn't know anything. Like, like dude, today, we're hitting shoulders. <laughs> and and I'm, uh, Mom, I'm going to be back. I'm going to be late tonight, Mom, because uh, we're hitting <laughs> shoulders. So uh, just get my dinner ready for me. I'll be home at 830. Uh, like, that shit was great, man. Like, that was really fun. But it's like, if we look at those, like, even in those studies, it's like, it seemed like the sweet spot was five to ten sets in a single session mm -hmm. and then anything over that they actually they started to see a decline at some point right once they got up to, to 20 or didn't no definitely no additional benefit i i yeah so this this idea of, of volume being detrimental uh is some studies show that and some studies don't they show like at, at best it's, it gives you nothing more like you just get you just get more of a pump so at best it's just going to take you longer to recover yeah and then uh, you can't hit that hammer again again um, and then at worst, that's, this is why I think that baking analogy and that critical temperature comes in is really handy is at worst you go backwards. Um, and it's not, it's not a good situation. Um, and then you also get into like, yeah, maybe that's a great way to get into overreaching, overtraining. If that thing it, it's going to, I think it's probably going to be pretty hard to push yourself there with straight sets, like into that overreaching, overtraining world. But if you throw enough supersets and enough drop sets, and uh, if you turn everything into cross, like not CrossFit but kind of CrossFit, um, you could you could push yourself there, and, and that that's where this idea of, of junk volume comes in, and giving yourself permission to like, hey, you want to do a bro split for four weeks and have a have a great time, go for oh, it, man, go for it, I, I yeah. support that. Um, but if that is the if that is the majority of your training, like so, just take. 
let's just look at like how this stuff permeates into into our industry. All right, so you're gonna do like fucking lunges and then take that lunge weight and back squat. Yeah, what's happening there when we do that? Let's talk about that, dude. That's CrossFit. <laughs> like that's fucking CrossFit. Like yeah. that. That is, is it any different than running a 400 meter and then getting on the leg press? Like you're tired. So what happens when we get really tired? Things we do suck. less work. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. Do. And you're still working hard. Like that is the point. I totally respect you, man. Like it's a hard ass workout. Like, but that's not what matters. Like we're but, not getting but, trophies but, but, for working but, hard. But there's research to show that like, like creating those hypoxic conditions, creating occlusion, yes. yeah. like those, those things can lead to hypertrophy. So if you've, if you've never done like, so that's the crazy thing. Like if you, and if you've never done any of this stuff, you've trained like straight sets your whole life, it might be worth doing that Maybe, stupid yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're, trying, because you're using a different stimulus. Right? Again, this conversation that we're talking about is mechanical tension as the primary driver. But there's, I, I would 100% believe that there is a time and a place for that kind of stuff. Yeah, for sure. So, so I think you could definitely make that argument for certain. But I think if you're training like that all the, the time, I think that's where you're you're missing the boat a little bit. And so there's and there's an entire school of thought that is like how how low of a weight yeah. can we put on the bar? And that like if you talk like you Ethan and I have to have these chats like that seems very counterintuitive to me. Mm -hmm. And very kind like I understand that like this is anecdotal in the bodybuilding world. But you don't see a lot of that stuff from in the top bodybuilders, even on drugs. Like, eh. I don't, well, you know, it's been a while since I've looked into it. It seemed like a lot of people were trying like that. I remember there was one particular bodybuilding coach. I'll pretend that I don't remember his name because I'm, I'm not sure that I do anyway. So I definitely don't want to throw somebody else under the bus. But that was like, that was the way he was training everybody. And that wasn't that long ago. I'm not sure if that's still the case, but. Things in bodybuilding don't really change. So from the evidence, the evidence-based side of things, I'm not really hearing a lot of people training like that. From the other side of the sport, it seems – I still think a lot of guys are doing that shit. I don't think uh, – well, I was going to say, did Ronnie do that stuff? Ronnie just did everything, man. Like, he was just – he just do everything. But I, So I don't know. Yeah. I think – I still think a lot of guys do train like that. I think that – because they are – they're doing the same thing. They're thinking like – and I get where they're coming from. They're, it's, not, it's not a stupid argument by any means. It's like those guys, it's probably not a great idea for those guys to be repping 600-pound squats going into the Mr. Olympia yeah. six weeks out like at 6% at, at body fat. Well, that's you know, the other like, thing is you might, there, might be a, there might be a logarithm. Like it might go down. Like it might be a U-shaped curve in that you get to a certain point in your strength level. And then it's really not worth it anymore because yeah. you can like because so you can hurt you can hurt yourself like yeah and and the, the amount of energetic cost of doing that I mean you're squatting six hundred pounds for ten reps like that's gonna that's gonna put you on your ass more than in my than my ten rep max is going to the other thing too that we're not like no one wants to spend three hours in the gym like <laughs> it, well yeah that's not true but you don't want to spend three hours warming up like so that's the other thing yeah. is it, it, the other argument is like you don't have for me as a father now like if i pre if i do a bunch of leg extensions and then i don't even have to warm up for squat and i don't have and all of a sudden i don't have an emotional component to my squat like i'm not worried about the really the weight on the bar and i'm just trying to work hard and make it suck like that might be a little bit easier for me whereas i have if i you know if i'm really worried about squatting and i'm worried about getting stronger and it's the first exercise and i'm i'm chasing this muscular tension that's a harder that's a harder ego trip then I'm gonna go. Yeah. I'm gonna go bang out four sets of leg extension to failure, and then I'm gonna try to squat 135 for 10 reps, and and that's where I think that you've already smashed it at that point, and I think I think that you've already triggered it in in that particular muscle group, and I would make the argument that you moving to that next set is probably just making you feel stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think at that point you probably just, just call it a day. And that that's like, if this hypothesis is correct, then how nice is that? Because that, that just tells us all we need to know about auto regulating a session It's like, as soon as you start to see a, a significant drop off in your work output, you're done. And then you go recover and then you, you come back at it as soon as possible again. So if that is the case, then, then hell yeah. Now, like there's definitely times where like you just described, like 
maybe I, I don't think that you'd be getting no stimulus from from doing um, a, like a one thirty five squat after doing like extensions. Like I, I think you'd still be getting some stimulus, like you said, the, the metabolite thing. Like I think that's that's definitely there seems to be some independent arguments that you that would uh, that would push you to drive that kind of adaptation. And uh, you know, so it's just I I just think that if we're doing that as the primary mechanism, I think we we are kind of missing something. It's it's not just about effort. Uh, at, at that point, like it's even if you're training really hard, you're probably not getting the same stimulus that you are. I don't, I just, uh, you think you are, but I, I don't think that you're getting absolutely nothing from, from doing it the other way around. But I, I still would err more on the side of just be done. <laughs> like if you're seeing that big of a drop off, just be done. Like why not just come back another time? And just... I think we have, this is, a, this is another study out of Brazil, the leg press leg extension. They essentially did yeah. that with the leg uh, leg press and the leg press to a leg extension, essentially a post exhaust, did work better than a pre exhaust and the post exhaust. They accumulated more volume, um, so I would I would lean towards for the majority of your training, you would want the single joint to be after if you're going to do both. So my argument is like, why would you do both in the same session? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a totally fair argument for sure. And I think that some people may have may have a reason to do that whether it's it just like maybe it's a psychological thing they just like they can't handle going after legs you know multiple multiple times a week uh like warm-up stuff time efficiency whatever it is maybe they do another sport I, I don't know whatever it is right um so i think the thing that's that's important about that is again considering the the central and peripheral factors and because a lot of people will make the argument that um like doing a a leg extension first is is going to create a bunch of peripheral fatigue so if we are doing that then we go to leg press any kind of additional stress that we're getting or any more fatigue that we're getting is just peripheral it's not central now um but it was never central to begin with it's so like the that, argument is they're making the agonist the limiter it, yeah i think so i think that they're saying like okay the reason you wouldn't want to do squats first is because you're going to be more centrally fatigued by the time you get to leg extension. Just call that systemic fatigue. I think what they mean is systemic fatigue. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that's the important distinction. But even so, I don't care whether it's systemic or whatever the hell you want to call it. If you're doing less work for that second exercise, I don't think it's what you think it is. That's the that's the whole premise, right? So so that's what people will say. Like, well, we do our leg extensions first because you know we won't be as tired by the time we get squats and we don't have to lift as much. You know, blah blah blah, like and it like because it, it, it central nervous system. Like you're like, well, no, that the central nervous nervous system was never part of this equation really to begin with. So like that, uh, and I think that that study kind of highlights that. If anything, I think you would like if you're gonna pre exhaust anything, I would pre exhaust like synergists or at, like that makes more sense to me. Like if you're gonna if you want the limiter in the squat to be the quads, yeah. why why wouldn't you like? pre-fatigue your glutes that's like the next place I'm, I'm going with all this is because i just i can't seem to understand that argument that people are making when they're fatiguing the agonist first well your muscle um, like if, if we can't just throw out all emj data but your muscle activation is gonna go down like you're that's yeah. what, that's what happens like so now are they it seems to be like they're 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 essentially hanging their hat on this effective reps schematic and yeah that. Well, it's like if I fatigue the agonist first, aren't I just going to use this, the the uh, the uh, synergist more? Yeah, that's that's what that's, that's what, it what looks I think. Like. But I don't that's what it think looks like it's it. usually not the argument that people are making. So I'm just not sure when I hear people talk about that if I'm understanding it incorrectly, or it's yeah, just they're the whole... not they're not saying like, hey, I'm going to pre fatigue the quads and then this squat is going to be a glute exercise. That's not no, how no, they're saying not yeah, no, 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 they're saying like my quads are going to be so fried that they're going to work harder on the squat well i think you just get you're just throwing two spawns and getting zero birds like a pat Davis. I, I i i think so yeah because because i think at that point yeah you're you're just every it's all fatigue like you're gonna feel your i i have no doubt you're gonna feel it and that's another that's that could be another reason for using it you have someone who doesn't feel mm -hmm. their quads when they squat and this was actually something that mike brought up on the uh the, the podcast the muscle memoirs podcast you said hey like what if you have somebody who who can't feel their quads when they squat and then they do a leg extension first, and then all of a sudden they feel their quads. I, I would, I guess, I think that's better. I think that's probably better, especially because here's the thing too: you can do leg extensions first and actually not have drop off in performance 
in your squats if you do the leg extensions in a reasonable manner. Yeah, if you, if you just take them to a set of seven and just try to feel something. Yeah, why not? I mean, I, I think that that – and, and, you know, I think a lot, of, a lot of guys do that in the bodybuilding world too that just like have like just beat up joints. <laughs> just like if I go in and squat first, it always ends badly. And if I do some leg extensions first, some nice light pump sets, like I go in, squats feel awesome. And I think if you're doing that and there's no reduction in load, then I, then I think you're, I think you're good. Like you can make that argument for sure. I think that if you're doing it, the leg extension is so hard that you're falling off the leg extension machine, crawling over to, to the squat rack and, and you put like four, two and a half pound plates on there. Then I, I don't, I don't think that we're really getting a whole lot at that point. It's like, just, just go home. Yeah. And I, what I've seen is like, people aren't really able to keep their movement patterns. Um, very it's like they're not in that situation like i haven't seen people be able to can keep their movement patterns very consistent on on I, I think like if you hack squatted someone like with there there were more constraints and like that you had more points reference points i think like then you may be able to whatever the but if you're trying to get like if we think about maybe like nine sets let's let's go high like I mean, if you do nine sets three times a week, you're already at 27 sets. Like, that's a lot of sets. Probably. Like, like most of us, if we're, if we're writing a program, we're probably going to start at 12, maybe 10, maybe, maybe like I'm at 16 sets, I think right now per week. And that's kind of low um, for me. And so, but I, in the program I wrote for this, this kind of, this podcast, I have, cause we, I'm, I don't really feel my hamstrings at all. An RDL. Okay, that's what I was going to ask you about. I, I was like, "What the hell?" We'll just talk about it during the. Uh, that, that's what I assumed you were doing that for. Yeah, so I, I I ran. I'm running a super set of hamstring curls into RDLs. Definitely can't like nowhere near as much weight as I've been. But I'm I'm essentially just trying. I don't think that how I was previously doing RDLs. I don't Do think I, was, for your I, 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 I just yeah. don't like even from a hypertrophy standpoint, like, so I just took off deadlifts and squats for almost like six months. I'm like, whatever, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm I got to practice what I preach. I'm like, not going to be attached to these lifts, maybe longer than that. Uh, and, and I, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Well, I just, yeah, I know. <laughs> well, you're a power lifter. Um, yeah. and, and it makes you, you can't do that. And so, but my, like you'll attest to this, like my legs, like visually. Yeah. Fucking exploded. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. The same. And so now like bringing these things back in and i come from a background of crossfit so i think i was using my quads and my low back for almost my vastus lateralis and my low back for almost everything and so can i even not that i think feeling things is a good thing when you're deadlifting i think feeling things when you're deadlifting is probably a bad thing if you're lifting sure a lot you're of, gonna feel bad things <laughs> yeah, if, you're, if you're lifting a lot of weight so like that's my idea with this is if i do hamstring curls first and then i go to an rdl can I feel anything in the back of my legs? Um, mm -hmm. and, and also, like, can I see anything? Uh, and you can't, really, unfortunately. But we're going to get there. Yeah, I would say it's, it's from too much hair, but I... I know <laughs> you got to shave. You got to clean it up. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I think that that's where you can make a really good case for, for, for doing this stuff. Like, anything can work in the right context sit with the right person so yeah i think that that that's a really valid way but i think that you're you're probably um when you're doing those those leg curls you're you're, you're not talking like multiple drop sets like and then immediately going over to a to a um an rdl it's like you're, you're just getting some some i'm also today. not i'm also not in my head i'm not thinking that this rdl is gonna be a huge driver of stimulus right now that's not yeah, yeah. that's not so, my goal yeah. i'm trying to get better like that's to me it's like skill acquisition Mm -hmm. um because i'm because mm -hmm. i don't have it's building into something like you, but, now maybe this next phase then maybe your rdl now that you've acquired a, a good pattern is now it's a muscle building exercise yeah because i don't have because a hamstring curl is only theoretically it, it's you know it's going to be it's hardest in a short position if people, yeah, if, people if, if, if people do it right and they don't fucking use momentum like mm -hmm. throw it out of the top uh, and, and so theoretically I'm missing the length in position. And this is something we talked about in the podcast with Pat Davidson is like, I'm missing that, that full stretch component, if you will, um, mm -hmm. on the hamstring. And, and so I want to get better at that. I want to see if I can turn that into something that I can feel, uh, mm -hmm. and see if that can, if that's worthwhile. Uh, and just cause 
it's something to get, I think a lot of us, we get into this and we want to get better at things. Um, and I'm not, I don't think I'm a very good deadlifter, uh, like maybe off the floor, I'm, I'm, I'm adequate, but from like an RDL perspective, like I'm, I don't feel like I'm doing it right. And that bothers yeah. me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I'm, uh, I'm glad we were able to talk about your, your RDL problem on the podcast. If Ben has a problem, he doesn't feel his RDLs. <laughs> sensitive, right? You're doing good. Is that a little tear? You okay? <laughs> uh, feel a lot, you feel a lot better now. You like you got you got that out. That's good. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, I, I did see I did see them, and they they did look a lot better than what I've seen previously. So yeah, so maybe mean, maybe any, like any, a little bit of uh, hamstring. Anybody in this world, I think you're going to have a little bit of body dysmorphia. Uh, just move. I can't even say the word. Right? You're gonna that that's gonna that's gonna come into play. Uh, and so, but the same thing happened for my lats, though. Like I never like felt my lats, and and I don't the I've never felt my hamstrings in anything really other than a hamstring. I've, I've felt them get sore, like I've felt them get sore from things, but I've never really felt them working concentrically in anything other than a hamstring curl machine. Uh, mm-hmm. And so that doesn't mean that I'm not using them. I think I have used them. I think they've hypertrophied fairly well. But I, that mind-muscle connection is probably not good to have all the time, right? I'm not saying you need a mind-muscle connection when you're going for a 1RM. But if, if you can't feel things from a hypertrophy perspective, you probably need to, you need to do that. Yeah, um, yeah. And posing-wise, hamstrings are probably the hardest thing for people to get. Yeah, yeah, it's it's always a challenge. I I still have a lot of trouble with that. I also don't have hamstrings at all, so that might be part of the problem. So you're but yeah, start doing this as well. Well, I just I just hit rear double biceps between every set. I just, well, I just get that. This could help with your multifidus, yeah. though. Yeah, well, I mean, we all know everyone's been talking about how small my multifidus is. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to get into that, but uh, I, I'm lacking in the multifidus department apparently. So <laughs> still trying to figure out how to. I don't isolate that bad boy. Um, so should we, should we talk a little bit about this? Uh, I guess we, we covered exercise order. We, we basically covered drop sets and myo reps and all that stuff yeah. too, really, right? It's all kind of the same thing. Again, if you, if you have to do less weight, fewer reps, you're probably not really doing a whole lot at some point. Well, For, just ask, ask yourself the question, like, does total volume in the work session, does that matter to you? If you're, if you're willing to, if you're willing to throw that, your work output away, um, and you're willing, if you're, if you've looked at the literature and you're willing to do that and say that it doesn't matter, you can, you can basically make a case for training any way that you want. Getting those, getting those nine sets, you can get them however you want. And if effort is your common denominator. And I, I think you can probably get really, really good results that way for a long period of time. People every do in cross every day in CrossFit do that, and, they, they, and some of them look amazing. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not going to say it doesn't work. But if you think about those CrossFitters, like what is their like if they're if they a lot of them come from previous other sports that they've been doing. But yeah. if if you look at a CrossFitter that's come up in the CrossFit world, like they're generally they they don't have a lot of pec development. They their lats generally aren't there because they don't know how because they're all shoulders. They're all rear delts and, yeah. and anterior Huge delts. Shoulders, yeah. And so then it's, and we've had this happen too. Is like, you have a great, you have a, a guy who actually benches a lot of weight, but his chest is like not there. Yeah. And so, and so then it's like, all right, how are, how are you bench pressing? Right. And then it might be great. Like then, then both of us are probably going to murder that guy with chest flies. Um, just cause he's just cause he's never, he hasn't really changed. He's the odd, the, the odds that he changes his bench press because we, we get attached to weight. Right? It's it's hard to take those things like like Dean's a perfect example. Like you try to retool that guy's deadlift, like and it goes down to it goes from whatever it is. In Dean's defense, I actually like his deadlift. Well, he's got such good levers. Yeah, he does. I think I think his deadlift actually for a deadlift, great. I don't give a shit about a hinge when we're deadlifting. Honestly, it's got to be hingy enough. That it doesn't need to be maximal hinge. Like it, it needs you need to be able to apply force in the ground to get to pick up the weight. So, and just want to say that because I know Dean, Dean gets a little sensitive too about his deadlift. Well, his squat did look exactly like his deadlift. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Back yeah, in the sure. day. Yeah, 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 for sure. And, yeah. But his, and his squat is, his squat is, his, his like, uh, Dean is actually a really, really good case study in that he had, he'll tell you this, he had awkwardly small legs. 
for how mm-hmm. strong was, yeah. strong he was. Like we're talking like how much is that guy done? Like seven hundred? It was just, I think seven twenty five in competition or something like that. Yeah. And he back squatted it, his back squat was it was like five something, right? At least, yeah. It was it was respectable for sure. It wasn't yeah. And and so that's where it, that kind of throwing this back into where we were before. Like if you change your if you don't get knee flexion. Like if your if your knees aren't going forward, and I think a lot of power, like they can squat a, a pretty large amount of weight without their knee, they can hit depth without their knees, yeah, without their knees going forward. And then I think that if you're using the squat for a quad hypertrophy, I don't think you're doing anything. So that's your quad. Like it, the erectors are probably going to be the limiter in the squat, regardless. Um, if you, I don't know if I get. Go I, ahead. Thought, I mean, if we're going to go here, let's. Go I, mean, I, I, might, I I just want to. I, because I've been thinking about that a lot as well. The erectors are working isometrically, right? So they're going to be, their, their amount of force that they're able to produce isometrically is always going to be way higher than what the quads can do concentrically, no? So I, I don't know that, I get what you're trying to say. I, I, I get what you're saying. Like, I get the point. I just think, I just, what's, I, what's that? What's going to extend the hip at the end of that squat motion? Because that's, people. Yeah, glutes. Okay. So, so you guys, so, but hamstrings aren't working. So I think like you're, so people will fold. I, I still, like, I think that people, because you think about what's the, like what happens in a squat. Like they start going up and they, they're starting they to kick extend back. their knees. They kick back. So they immediately load their hips. So I think their quads are actually the weakest point. Their quads are the weakest point. They just don't ever use them. So they just go like, oh, fuck that. Like, shoot right back, go all hips. So I don't, yeah, like, so I don't think it's necessarily, well, so I think. If they go to a good morning, like, eventually, I think what we've seen is like all, like, so you're saying, like, if you could train your quads, you can make the quads are the limiter. And then because of that, you're going, to, you're creating another limiter. Yes. Yes. In, in, because now you're moving it more towards a good morning. So now you're actually using your erectors yeah. for something that you don't want them to use. That's your. Argument. Yeah. I think your quads are the limiter and you doing an upright squat and a squat that that's linear. Um, but I don't think that they're the limiter in the actual task of getting the job done, nor do I think that the, the erectors are necessarily. Um, because I, I just think that, I, I guess at some point, like what happens, like you, you just fall over, right. When you, when the weight gets to like, you can't get the weight up, like it goes back down. Um, so, so what's, what's happening there. Um, I don't know. It's just something that I, that I've like just thought more about. And I'm like, I'm not sure that um yeah i'm not sure that the 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 uh back extensors are, are what are failing out necessarily with with that well this was my argument like of just being kind of an anti-fragile argument it's like just get everything as strong as possible yeah why the hell not yeah so just get everything as strong as possible and then if you're still getting knee flexion and you're folding the research would say that you're probably still getting quads I think so. Yeah. Like, yeah, that, that's, that's part of it too. Is like, I, I think that we're still getting quads there and I don't I, like, I, I mean, I can tell you, I feel my quads when I low bar squat, like, I, like they're still being stimulated for sure. And they'll get sore afterwards. Uh, and I don't feel my back at all. And this is like a dumped over like low bar shitty, shitty squat. Like it's, I'm, I'm getting the job done. But if you think about that from your and I've watched these low bar squats. The first time I saw them, I was like, whoa, what the fuck is going to be? Dude, I yeah. almost like helped you. What are you doing? I, th- I think I almost spotted you the first time I saw him in the jump. Yeah, I, 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 was like, I was like, holy shit. Is this dude going to fall on? Is this awake going to go over his head? Uh, and, and so, but to put that into context, it's still 25 to 30% less than your deadlift. It's just on your back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that doesn't that just have to do with, with the lever arm at some point? You know, like I, I'm, you know, we, we've both, we've talked extensively about, about squats and trying to like fix hours and stuff. But when it comes to powerlifting, like I the, only have, we'll have one task. Yeah. Like I got to get, crease my hip below my knee. And the more that I try to rewire that thing and try to do it just from a physics standpoint, like, and this is something like, this is something I'm starting to explore because I'm, I'm not, I do not have a physics background whatsoever i'm just trying i'm trying to get into understanding a little bit better but if i if i try to stay upright in a low bar squat just based off of my anthropometrics the bar is like almost behind my foot <laughs> like if i were to try to stay upright with the bar that low on my back it just doesn't make any sense from a physics standpoint so like it's like it's like 
way behind my center of math. Like it just, it just, doesn't, so what makes sense is just to fall forward slightly or a lot in my case. And then like it, everything just stays like it, it, you can just feel it. And you, the bar go, it, goes straight up and down. It's straight up and down. It's, it's accomplishing that task. And um, you know, as long it, it's like for me, just subjectively, it's, it's a much more uh, safe feeling Thing. Yeah. Like I don't, I just don't feel like I'm all over the place. You know, it's just like, it's, it's locked in. So it's not like, uh, I think you, you have to consider a lot of things when you look at, at a squat, like where is the bar? Cause I can tell you, like I can overhead squat, like I can make it look decent enough. When I overhead squat, the only thing I can do is drop straight down because if I allow my <laughs> shoulders to come forward, it's going to go way in front of my center of mass. Like, so in order for me to do that overhead squat, I, I literally have to drop my pelvis straight down and my knees have to go forward. When that bar is lower behind my back, it's more like a deadlift. I'm, I'm going to have to hinge more just to keep that thing centered up. So I think like, and, and that's, that, that may just be my own, like, I think that for the most part, just generally that would carry over to anybody. But I think certain, cause I've also seen certain uh, squatters like low bar squat perfectly upright. And I think it's like, almost completely anthropometrics. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, would, I, I would agree. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And your body's going to find, like, the other thing is you've been, you have, this isn't your first rodeo. Like, your body's yeah, going to- built up a ton of tolerance for that thing. It, and your body's going to probably find, you're probably, you're probably going to find the path of least resistance yeah. o- over that much time. Like, in my squat, like, I, from a back squat perspective, you just get into the case of like, is it the best exercise for the, yeah, yeah. and, and I don't know that I'm not going to pick squatting. Like I'm, if I had access to a really good hack squat or leg press right now, I probably wouldn't be squatting. I probably wouldn't be squatting, but mm-hmm. I'm having fun squatting. I'm liking the challenge of it. Um, and I'm excited to like get this thing as heavy as I can and just get stupid with it. And, and for August, but after August, like I'm probably just going to stop squatting again. And, and so the one thing I'll say about the squat though, that uh, like a barbell squat is that it, um, I love how this podcast always turns into us talking about squatting. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's really like, God, no, please. Like, talking about squatting again. Uh, so, so, um, but the one thing that I will say about it is yeah. it, it, it is a lot different than a leg press and just the way that. Um, this is like, this is gonna sound super stupid, but like your legs are literally like against your stomach at the bottom mm-hmm. of, of the, I don't think that you're loading as much in the stretch position on a leg press as you are in a squat. Does that make any sense? I could be completely off there. It's just like, 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 I think you're like, you're literally like pressing against your own body. It's almost like, it's you're almost not like getting a stretch reflex from the top. I think I'm, I wanted, that'd be interesting. I don't know. So don't it, know it, the, the way that like, it's easier to think about it. I almost think about it as doing like, uh, you know, because like, you love to do your calf raises, right? So if you did a calf raise just like um, on, on the ground, right? Like you just did you know, just your heels on the ground, you do a calf raise, right? If you were to go like at the bottom of that range of motion, your foot is on the ground. You are no longer loading your gas yeah. rod, yeah. right? So if you do that calf raise to the same range of motion, but your heel is off the ground, you're keeping tension on that gas rod the whole way. And I kind of see the squat as being very similar for the quads and, and the, the hip extensors and that it's different from a leg press in that sense, because I, I still think just that little bit of being able to just kind of like, you're kind of chilling on your stomach a little bit with your legs. I mean, unless you're going like super, even then, like I still feel like you're, you're able to push more against it. I guess in a low bar squat, you're able to do a similar type of thing in a sense, like you are kind of folding against your, your thighs. Maybe that's why people, one of the reasons why people can, can load up even more uh in that in that squat i don't know it's just like it's just a thought so so i think that you could make a case like in that sense because i've thought about it a lot because i i really don't care that much like i i really i i just want to do what's best for my development at this point i like to squat but i don't need to do it but there there does seem to be something that's just like i don't know man i just get like much I get a lot of like local fatigue from, from a squat and I get that on the leg press too, but it just feels different. And I'm just trying to figure out why the hell that might be. And I think that's the only thing that I can really <laughs> come up with for why that might be the case. Cause the range of motion is very similar. Um, it's just like, what's going on there. There's, I feel like there's something about, and there's and, and per, like, uh, as far as soreness goes, 
Like I, I tend to get way more sore from squats than I do from leg press. Well, that would make sense for my eccentric component. Um, if, if what I'm saying is true for sure, right? Because if I'm offloading a little bit at the bottom in that stretch position on the squat on the on the leg press compared to the squat, then then that would make a lot of sense. So so maybe there is a little bit. Yeah, I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't guess you're getting as much loaded stretch. I'd have to. I, there's got to be a way to quantify that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I think the solution. What I want to try next is a horizontal leg press, and that's what I'm gonna break the piggy bank hopefully mm. and buy is because that gives you the best of both worlds. Yeah, totally. mm-hmm. um, and so if we can find a good horizontal leg press, which is kind of like a hack squat, but enough that you can change it for different people, uh, the problem more than a hack squat. Yeah. The problem with hack squats is like everybody's got to do the same. Everybody's got to move in the same range of motion. Like yeah, uh-huh. you can yeah. you, you can mess can't do them. You can mess with your feet. You can mess with where, like, you can mess a little bit with it, but it, it's got to go in the same, especially the arc ones. Like, it's going in the same arc. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, They're great for some people. Yeah, if you can find if you can find the one that works for you, like, it could be it could be amazing. But that's that's that. I think Chasm shared he shared that Atlantis one with me. That that thing because the amount that you can change it and, and morph it to wow, it looks amazing. Sweet. It's probably gonna cost a small car, but. Uh, we'll see. He needs a car when he got big legs. Uh, yeah, I can walk to the store. It's like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fifteen miles. Uh, so we we've, we've we've hit. I think every one of our we've talked about exercise order. We talked about drop set. We talked about uh, pre exhaust. So the the research really is is mixed, and you can you can make a case for whatever you want to make a case for, I think, with the current research that's out there. Um, you can cherry pick, you can do whatever you want. And if that makes you feel good and you feel, if, if that makes you feel confident in what you're doing and you're trying hard, I think that you could see great results. But don't take that, your results, or even your clients getting results, don't take that as that is why this is working. Uh, that, that would, because, especially if you're working with untrained people, like you've, anything that you do is probably getting them to that critical temp and, is, and hopefully you're not burning them down. Um, but that, that's not a, you're not making a masterpiece painting there. Um, you're just, you know, you're just doing a little bit of finger art in terms of, of difficulty of the task. Not to say that that's, that's probably the most important thing in our current world is getting people to accumulate muscle mass so they can be more metabolically flexible. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just not a very, it's just from a muscle, from a strength conditioning standpoint, that's a behavioral problem, uh, an interesting behavioral problem, not an interesting scientific problem. Mm-hmm. What, what we're saying is if you are at the point where you are trying to pound the hammer of five to 10 sets as many times as possible per week, working on quality training volume to produce mechanical tension, that is where, as many of you know, I'm a compulsive gambler, um, still permeates into my entire world. That is where I would make my bet. Um, yeah. Given the mechanistic research, given the applied research, is that, that is where I would put my money. And then I would also, I would put the bulk of my money there, but I might also put some, I might also parlay, I might also put some other money, I might also might have some backup bets um, with, with less amount of time on, on, on those other qualities. Um, yeah. and, and also, that shit's fun. Um, totally. Yeah, I think, again, like the, the, psychological, the psychological argument is, is always big here in that. I think people just really like different phases of training and different focuses. And I think that that, that can be used in, in that regard really well. We both do that. I think that that, that can be really, really great. And this, there may be some, some independent variables there that, that make that a, a good, good option. Um, you know, so I think the nice thing about this is that we're going to use this as our bulk of our training focus is that it's, it's pretty easy to determine where you're at and where you like what you need to go to. And I think that what, what I would recommend doing for someone, if you're trying to figure out like, if I, am I still getting productive volume on certain exercises with certain exercises order or whatever it is, take a couple of weeks and just do a all of you just do first sets on everything, right? Like as you always call it, right? Just do a, do a full body routine and, and just see where your maximum, when you're fresh, what you're able to produce. 
and let's just take a simple example, leg extension and, and, uh, and leg press or something, right? Figure out where you're, you come in, first exercise is your leg extension. Another day, the first exercise is your leg press. What's your maximum on that? Go to a 10 RPE, you know, figure out what it is. Do a, do a few sets, see, see where you're at. Uh, and then if, if you do those exercises in the same session and there is significant drop off within that, then you need to consider either A, I, I can't handle that amount of work. There could be a, a bunch of reasons that, that that could be the case. I, I don't know. I don't think we're going to get into that today. Maybe that's a conversation for another day. Um, or maybe I'm just training too hard on those initial sets. Maybe if I pull back the RPE, then can I sustain a, a good quality amount of work? Um, it, you know, you take a little bit of time to figure that out with the exercises that you're going to use. Then I think it makes it very easy to either auto-regulate or to plan your training out and know, hey, I got... I got six sets for quads in one day. At this current phase of my training career, that's where I'm at. And I'm going to run that until I can do more or whatever. Like, but for this period of time, this training block, I'm going to go up to six sets in a workout. I know after that, it's kind of shit. And I can see that by the fact that I have to start decreasing the load on all of my exercises or decreasing the reps. And I, that makes it very easy to, to kind of figure out what works best for you. And then I, I think you and I are both kind of biased towards the higher frequency approach and that yeah uh, I'm, i immediately hear that i hear that and i'm like okay try six by two try doing that leg press then leg extension however you want to do it leg extension then try doing that six by two six sets two days a week or try three sets four days a week just split them up and see, see what happens. happens yeah yeah and i think that if we're this this argument that we've made if if this is the case then i think that that's a really intelligent strategy and I think that we're getting the most out of all of those reps and we're getting the most out of our effort and time. And I think that that's, that's really important. What does it equate to in a training career? I don't know. Fucking three pounds of muscle, dude, I'll take that. <laughs> like, I'm cool with that. Like, that'd be great. I, I have no idea what it equates to. You're going to get results either way. If you're consistent enough and do all the other things that are involved. But I, I think if you're really trying to maximize things, I think we can make a, a, a pretty strong argument for why that would be a good approach most of the time. <laughs> Yeah, most the majority of the time. I think that's what we're arguing for this approach the majority of the time. And so this is my I'll just share up this this program that that I think is reflective of what we've been talking about so people can um so this is when the gym opens and people so people have probably gotten they they hopefully haven't lost muscle mass. Maybe they've even gained some if they've never worked in high rep ranges before. Um and so, so if that was novel, maybe they've increased their glycogen stores. Yeah, so they, they've, very possible. 100% mm -hmm. possible. Uh, go for it. Uh, get yourself some gains, but those gains might not actually be gains. They might just be, you know, task specific, uh, but they're still, you're still seeing dials move, which is important mm -hmm. for people. And, and, and honestly, probably winning in our current environment, just getting, a, getting some wins is, is probably going to help people mentally. Uh, and so I have the squat performance day, which is essentially two sets to a, to a legit, uh, like I did, my first set was a nine. I probably could have gotten 10 if I would have gone in the tank. And then the second set, I got seven and I went to, I went to the graveyard. Um, and then I was done squatting. Um, I think if I did, a, it'd be interesting like next week to do a third set. I think of that third set, I probably would have gotten five to four. Um, yeah, at that point. Yeah. And then what do you but if you went to a seven or an eight on the first set, you might get 10 reps on all three sets. So that's, that's, I'm making an auto-regulated, uh, yeah. argument for the squat volume day is to take that 10 rep and then after you can't get seven you're caught yep so I, I got a velocity stop for me which is 0.35 so that's about an eight um and i'm going to stop at the rep for that uh, but you can easily do this with rirs or rps however you want to call them and so then I'm, I'm you could go six sets so if your work capacity allows you to go six sets and you're never you're always getting those you're getting seven to eight reps great i'm going to chop it at six sets because that's just a lot of squatting um, yeah somebody you want to put a cap on it for sure yeah but like so i, I might I, I haven't i'm starting this this week and so i my guess is i might only get three sets but on week four of this i might get six yeah. um and the weight's going up with that with that first week because i like every because people are i think you need to do some amraps in the beginning of because you want to do kind of a linear periodization model when you come back to the gym because you're getting back you, there's a lot of neural stuff that's you're just getting primed um mm -hmm. and so that's kind of how i'm treating the squat the bench uh, like 
I'm not trying to barbell bench that often, so I'm just doing that one, and then I'm blasting it on DV bench on, on the other day, where I probably get more peck, arguably. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bencher as, who gets a lot of anterior delt and triceps. Um, and so I think mm -hmm. the DB bench for me is probably a, a better play. Um, keeps you, keeps you away from getting trouble, but you could do the same thing on bench with this workout. Uh, and then I have, I have, uh, it's about 16 sets for legs and then, uh, 12 to 16 for depending on how you count stuff for upper body, but you could do it. So in my, my argument is this is a four day a week program, but I'm going to turn it into six. Um, Let's break it up. Yeah. So I'm going to turn, I'm going to, I'm going to do, God forbid, I'm going to do an arm workout, uh, just arms oh, yeah. uh, two days a week. And let me tell you, like doing an arm workout after squatting is so different than doing an arm workout by itself. So it's funny. So you, you can do a lot more when you don't squat first. Not only can I do, I'm not, I don't know my, I'd have to, I can do more definitely on curls. Uh, okay. Try, Biceps, triceps, I'm, I'm pretty consistent with. Curls, curls. there's definitely, I'll probably get two more reps if I do it first. Um, so I'll always do curls first because I don't know why. That's just me. You I, have to, yeah. I, it makes sense. It was in Arnold's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding. So th this is weird. It, it, it probably has really nothing to do, I don't think, with, with gains, but blood flow I've talked to a lot of people about like, if I do arms and legs in the same, I don't get the same pump. Whereas yeah. if I just do arms, like, you know, all my, all the blood in my body is probably rushing to my, my biceps in my mind. Given that they're the, the smallest muscle on the upper body, it's, it's amazing per volume. It's amazing how much time and effort we put into them. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> so, so that, that's kind of what I'm running um, on this current block. And I'm going to run it till it's dry. Uh, just because I haven't had a barbell for I, before we got the this set up down here, I hadn't had a barbell for almost almost four weeks, um, and so I'm I'm excited about it. See where see how fast I can progress it up, um, and I'm really I'm honestly really really excited about about squatting again, um, and I haven't been excited about squatting for for some time, and so I'm yeah, you probably need that. a little break. Yeah, well, I bet you. Uh just being bigger, <laughs> a bigger muscle should theoretically be able to produce more force. Like I, I bet you, you'll come back to it. Once you get through the neural phase again, you should potentially have more runway. I'm interested to see if like doing, taking a good six ish months, maybe even more, maybe even towards eight of not squatting and building up hypertrophy. Cause you would think that, right. You would think that building up more leg muscle, I could be able to come back to the squat and lift more weight. Or maybe not. Uh, maybe it's just a. That's what in all compound movements. I just wonder, like, how much of it is a skill? Yeah, yeah, and, and it's all or just like putting the brakes on inhibitions that, that your brain is is putting on you doing the weight. It's just like, hey, like the more that you expose yourself to that heavier weight, the more your brain just becomes okay with it. And so I think that that's a huge part. Like, I, I think that, uh, I mean, like right now I'm in a powerlifting days because I'll, I'll throw these in. It's, it's a nine week lower volume. I kind of use it as a, just, just to decrease the volume for a bit and then do something fun and like the, increase very, your intensity. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. But you have access to, phase. you have access to, you got, you, you're lifting it. Where are you lifting? Katie flow? Katie flow. Yeah. 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 So we got plenty of weight. So, but it's, it's a primarily barbell, uh, program. Like I have some other stuff in there, but, um, yeah, like I, I think it just takes, it's going to take a little bit of time. Like I'm already seeing that, like that. I, I know that my strength is there with it, mostly just low bar squats because I haven't low bar squatted in, in a long time. I know that the strength is there. It's just getting back to the skill of actually being able to do that particular lift and feel comfortable with that load on my back. Dude, Dude. even with, even with the, the North Carolina internet, are you serious? You still, <laughs> still out? Um, um, Steph's there I am again. Steph's just looking into Ben's beautiful eyes. It's a good thing I hit record, isn't it, big guy? It's a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so doesn't look very interested in what I'm saying. Like season, season, oh, season, season, yeah, yeah, season three episode, good. season three episode. What's one. going on? Did you just trans? Are oh, you back? Yeah, oh. season right, three right. episode one, baby. <laughs> yeah, <here we> go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, karma. I should have never said anything bad about the internet. Um, How did that happen? <laughs> it's all right. Uh, so, hey, if you guys are still listening to this, uh, we are in season three, episode one. We will be back 
um, likely two weeks from now. Um, and we were, I'm trying to get Evan Pekin on. I'm a, he doesn't know yeah, yet. It's got to happen. Yeah. I'm going to talk. I want to talk to him about energy system stuff. We've been, oh, yeah. we've been jamming on, on the internet, just talking back and forth. Um, so I think I'm going to ask him and uh, have him send us some papers and we will, uh, we will drop this on the interwebs and maybe just edit up our, um, the little itinerary here and we can send that out for people. Um, any, any last words? I already said that my, I closed out the show already while you were um, gone. Sweet. So, sweet. Yeah. <laughs> so we use my recording again. Second outro. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit. Are you, are you currently taking on clients? Yeah, I, I probably have room for like one or two more remote clients. I'm, I'm trying to, to kind of build up the in-person thing here in Austin once, once things get back to normal. But uh, yeah, I, I could take a couple, a couple more in remote clients maybe if, uh, if anyone was interested. Right. Uh, yeah. If you're interested in that, uh, just DM Ryan. He'll get back to you probably at the start of season four. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So. No, I'm on I'm on Instagram frequently. I check it at least once a month. So no, I'm making a comeback. You know, I had uh, Matt Tommy was was giving me some shit yesterday, and he's making me feel bad. How, how did he call you on your phone? Like, how was he giving you shit? Text message. I got a letter. I got a letter from him. Oh, it's mail. good. Good call. Good call. Yeah, call yeah. Me. I didn't touch it though. I lysed all the shit out of it before I opened it. Um, so yeah, he's, <laughs> I mean, we haven't, we haven't had one COVID joke, but I feel like uh, you probably had COVID like a year ago for sure. Oh, dude, are you kidding me? I was drinking that shit for breakfast. That's, that's yeah. no, yeah. I, I mean, Tio, Tio for sure. Like I, that guy's never washed his hands. Like the, <laughs> <laughs> this is, I hope he's still, I hope he's still listening to this point. Like my first thought, like legitimately my first thought when this pandemic hit, I was like, damn. Teal is going to wash, maybe he's going to wash his hands. And then he's, and then someone posted about it, like washing hands. And Teal's like, Teal literally wrote like, man, I'm terrible about that. And I was like, I've literally, dude, I've literally watched that dude just like cut up raw meat and like wipe his hands off the paper. Towel. That's my kind of guy. <laughs> uh, dude, the paper towel takes all the salmonella out of your hands. Ludicrous. It's, it's Ludicrous. a proven fact. Bounce, they, they, the right I would watch him. He would like touch raw meat, and then he would like make. He would like touch every one of the glasses in the cabinet. He'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> like I know, I want that one. Around the top. I'm like, Jesus, I'm just having a just having a food food <laughs> uh, safety heart attack. Yeah, you, you're pretty serious about that. I'm not sure. I don't really get it, but uh, you know, I'm over here just building my immune system.